Welcome to Coming Clean, the podcast dedicated to common sense environmental dialogue, environmental optimism, and real environmental solutions. This show is proudly powered by Orsted. Welcome back to Coming Clean, your podcast host, Benji Backer here, and I am so glad to have my friend, Zara Biabani on today. She has been a ally in this fight for a very long time. We're about the same age. Uh, she's a Texan moving to New York and uh, a climate optimist, but also comes at this from more of the traditional climate activist perspective. Recently wrote a book about climate optimism and how that is so important. And before diving pretty much into her entire bio for her, I will let her introduce herself. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here, Benji. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, short introduction. I'm yeah. a Texan moving to New York, doing the reverse of what people are seem to be doing. <laughs> um, and I studied environmental studies in college, started posting about it on social media, what I was learning. Um, that that took off. Um, and then during the pandemic, realized that sharing all of this kind of heavy news and, and realities uh, was detrimental to my mental health. And a lot of other people resonated with that. So started sharing positive climate news stories inspired by my friend, your, your friend too, Catherine Kellogg. Um, and that, that took off as well. And I, I saw that really resonating with people. Um, and so the culmination of like the weekly exercise of finding positive environmental news stories for two and a half years um, has really been this book. And I am really intentional about cultivating like data-driven trends um so people can have entryways into the climate movement that are more than just sustainable swaps um so that's that's what the book is about i also kind of like live live out this optimism through entrepreneurship for me um so i have a startup that's in the circular economy software space yeah and and i want to go into that as well but you brought up kind of the how you got into uh, climate optimism and Catherine kellogg was actually one of the early guests on this podcast and she talked a lot about kind of those those practical things that you can do. But I, what I like about your perspective is that it's more within the way that young people are thinking about this, which is that holistic perspective of, of the, the worldwide problem. And you're, you're focusing on really good news that has massive scale. The whole book is about these kind of massive good changes that have been happening. And I was just sitting in a room with a bunch of fortune 500 CEOs who are, who I believe actually are, really thinking about climate in a in a truly authentic way. And one of the scientists that was also there was saying that, yes, we have a lot of work to do, but we've also averted uh, some of the worst impacts that we could have had from climate change already. Like we've already avoided yeah. those. And so why do you think, despite the progress that we've made, and even though we know that we need more to do more work, why do you think the the fear based movement is still so prevalent? Because we still see people sitting and blocking traffic. We still see people ruining, uh, you know, like the 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 the, the pool in in Europe uh, that was like just this last weekend. Uh, obviously, the paintings, all those things that have been kind of all over the internet. We still see that. Why is that so pervasive? Even though we're starting to make progress, uh, do you think? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, even though I'm 24 and haven't, haven't lived a, a long life, I think a lot of that energy within the movement stems from kind of really, really young people who are genuinely terrified for, for their futures, which is a very valid and, and rational response. Um, but they maybe haven't lived in a world where climate change wasn't kind of front and center in terms of large problems. Um, it's a, it's a sensitive topic, but I, I try and kind of toe the line in the book of, of acknowledging like how life is never, has, has never been better than, than it is, uh, at, at this point in time. Um, and a, a whole different range of metrics, um, from global prosperity to, uh, age yeah. to yeah. diversity, to literacy levels, um, to, the percentage of people that have access to clean water um, to the percentage of people who can, can go through secondary schooling. And I also think that like this kind of climate anxiety and anger can sometimes be a very privileged uh, problem. 
right. again, it's, it's, it's a really sensitive subject. And I want to toe the line because the, the anger and fear I think is very valid. And I feel a lot of it myself and have in my younger years channeled it into more like a, aggressive, um, tactics or, or expressions. Right. But, um, we don't really see these kinds of protests being, you know, in, in the streets of some of the countries and areas that are most affected by this phenomenon. Right. Um, so I think that's something that's really important to acknowledge is it's a privilege to like go into the Louvre and, and throw right. soup on, on a painting and think about what the people who are most affected by the crisis, like how would, how would they maybe respond to that? Right. Like, does that, that doesn't, so yeah, it, it's complicated, I, but I think. Well, I think one of the really cool things about what you just said though, is, is so true is I was at an event at Stanford and they had flown in uh, some African uh, climate activists who blatantly said that in their in their work they don't use the words climate at all, and it's not because people don't believe in climate change; it's because that's not the most important issue on people's minds. It's food security, it's water security, it's these things that yes have a tie to climate change and and changing weather patterns and in storms and all those things. But like that's not the way that people are thinking about it in these places. And that's even true in the United States. There are a lot of, you know, Americans who are lower income or in certain areas of the country geographically that like this isn't the number one issue on top of their minds. And yes, it's very important, but it is a privilege where like you have your other needs met when you're thinking about climate change as a topic. And so the alarmism, to your point, kind of falls on deaf ears for a lot of people. And I guess you, you you talk about this in the book, but I guess I would love for you to expand on it. I don't think that you going like, I don't think going after is the right term. I don't think you focusing on the downsides of climate alarmism or like doom and gloom are like attacking those people. I think it's more like we need to move in a different direction than, than has been kind of prioritized. Can you talk through what what you've seen in your many years of activism now, even as you know, still a Gen Zer like I am? Like, where are the problems in the doom and gloom? Like, where do why is that an issue? Why does that work less than optimism? And why shouldn't people pursue that if that's kind of what they think is the best way forward? Yeah, I think with with this doom and gloom or, or very nihilistic approach, there's kind of two outcomes. One being that the the person just disengages from action and engagement with the issue completely. Again, takes a, takes a good amount of privilege to be, to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, two, the, the, the individual perhaps has, has some blinders on when it comes to what what needs to be done and what are the strategic ways um about what are the strategic ways of going about that change mm -hmm. um when i was young like when i was in high school i was like a super like i was very very passionate and i still am but i was not strategic and i had these like blinders on and i was like i will not talk to people my i don't know if i ever told you this but um my dad has worked for BP. He, he stopped uh, or he got laid off uh, several years ago because he was working in biofuels, but he worked for BP for a majority of his career. And he's like also the best person I know. And I think that relationship was one of the main reasons I was so like, I, I was really interested in what you were telling me and then kind of delving into that, that research about like bridge building in terms of bipartisan climate action. Um, but I think something with, with, a lot of this generation is just like the unwillingness to come to the table um, mm -hmm. and even talk about these issues. And I know it can be hard when we're in a really polarized society and some, some people, um, some politicians don't acknowledge other people's basic rights. So I don't want to put that expectation on, right. on the people, but if you have the privilege of, of like, if you have the privilege of being able to come to the table, you need to, you need to do that. And actually come to the table. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's the thing. Like you, you have a family member who worked you know, in the oil and gas industry and you know that they're not just evil people. And so you're willing to engage with those people, but you're right. There's a lot of people who are in their silos who are like, I can't engage with 
somebody who's right of center, someone who's uh, involved with the energy industry, someone, whoever, but actually those are the people that you need the most. <laughs> and so if you're yeah. going to come to the table, you need to actually include those voices and chances are they're not as evil or even evil at all um, compared to how you think they are. So I, I think that that's a really unique perspective. I mean, when you look at this conversation, I think it's starting to trend towards optimism, but I, I believe that the pessimism has really hurt the movement because it basically makes people feel like there's no chance, no hope, there's no way to actually move forward. And then the people who actually do engage, so that turns off a lot of people from engaging, the people who do engage are the ones who like turn off a whole different section of the population from being engaged because they're like, well, if, if, if protecting the environment and fighting climate change means blocking traffic, like I don't want anything to do with that. And I'm going to go the other way do you think it's too late to start changing that narrative in the same speed that we need to start changing policy and everything? Or do you feel like the tide is is moving in the right direction compared to what needs to happen from a like timeline with science, with technology, with all the things that we need to do? I don't think it's, I, th- I, I, I think it might be later than desired to avert like, I think it might be later than desired to get to the, you know, under 1.5 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. But it is not too late to avert any further consequences, um, which every percentage of a degree matters. Um, And I think a lot of it has to do with just like you mentioned, the language of how we talk about this issue. Um, One, I I don't know if I, I told you this again, but this, I, in January of 2020, Two, I went to in Houston. Um, a ma- it was some sort of rally, Trump rally. I can't remember what it was called, but it was like you know after the it was quite after the election, right. um, and so it was like an intense like the people there were intense. Um, but basically, I like wanted to go and like talk to people and interview people and not use the word climate change, but talk about like the the freeze and how that impacted like our grid and different issues um, like pollution and just kind of gauge people's thought processes and what they were willing to share. Um, By no means did I like come out of it having like convinced somebody to, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think there was like a lot of really interesting conversations. And I think like for the people who are willing and like interested to kind of like jump and jump across the aisle um, not everyone is, but like, there are a lot of people who are like, I I got two of my friends and my boyfriend to go with me. Like, <laughs> and they, they all like did this with me. Um, like you, you should do it because th- like that kind of more extreme action, um, is going to move the needle faster and get us closer to where we want to be. Yeah. And I, and I, that actually makes me think of, of like Ron DeSantis, who's obviously running for president in Florida. Um, he, he led a lot of bipartisan environmental initiatives that had direct ties to lowering emissions and fighting climate change from a resiliency perspective. Um, really pro EV, like was very pro solar, uh, and, and pro nuclear and pro, uh, resilience on the coasts and restoring the coasts, worked with Democrats, Democrats applauded him. He does not use the word climate change or the words climate change yeah. at all. And in fact, I think even in an interview this week, he said that climate change isn't a problem. And so it, it, there is this reality that I think climate activists have to realize, which is that the people who don't necessarily see eye to eye with them aren't as far off from them as they might think. Like the language is, is different. And, and, and mm-hmm. I would be at more on the side of saying that DeSantis's language on this has not been the greatest than to say that it has been. But if we can get somebody who, you know, this week said that they don't really think climate change is a problem to still do the things that we need to do to move forward on climate, then like we might as well work with those people and try to make that happen. So, and you probably saw that at the Trump rally, which is like, maybe the words climate change wouldn't turn them on, but talking about the importance of energy reliability and security and diversifying your energy portfolio and making more of those things in the United States, like all those things relate very well to a audience that might not have been quote unquote what society thinks of as on board with climate change uh, reform and so do you feel like from what you're seeing that because of the work that you've highlighted in the book that that the optimistic part of climate change is starting to take over or do you feel like the problem is not that optimism isn't dominating the climate dialogue it's that 
the the pessimism just gets more attention and more news and that that's unfortunately what people pay attention to how do you how do you see this going forward and how do you promote optimism in a world where the pessimism just sells so much better yeah so i see this this book as really being for a lot of people who live in the west and are really passionate about this issue and are more angry activists and they don't have a way of channeling that anger into anything productive other than you know, switching diets, which is great and, and awesome, um, or making someone else feel bad about their choices, um, which is less awesome, but you know, nice. that's, that's something, um, this, I really want like this book to give them like an entryway into like, this is like a movement that is seeing success, um, in whichever area it might be. And I don't have the exact gigatons of carbon that it can draw down. Um, that's right. a, a lot of other great books do that in terms of technologies, and innovations, but I I've seen story after story, this is taking off and it's fueled by people coming together. So right. whichever one catches your attention, instead of complaining about how, how this is going to eradicate society, like get involved. Um, and I think even when I say that message, which is kind of, kind of abrasive, but it is the reality. I see so many people, especially post pandemic, like stuck on their phones and using that as activism. Um, and, and I just think there's a limit to, to how you can use that and what impact you can really make. Um, and that's at saying as, as someone who like literally got started as like a climate influencer. Right. Um, so, um, I, I, but I, I've had conversations with people who have read it and, and they're like, I didn't know ex- like what I wanted to, to help with. There's, there's so much. And, um, so I really want this to be like solve that problem because I do believe that's the biggest problem is like not knowing where to channel the passion. Yeah. And I think that that's where like people have undersold the importance of local action in this. Like it, this is such a, 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 a far ranging problem that even like national action isn't enough, right? If this is a global issue that we all like, have to tackle together. And so in my opinion, from what I've noticed, and especially from the optimism standpoint, where the most progress gets made is at the local level and at the community level, because people can do what's best for their locality, for their community. They can work with other people. Optimism sells a lot more in a local community than it does trying to like shape that narrative at the national level where it's Trump versus Bernie versus Biden versus Ted Cruz. And it's just visceral all the time. It's not that way at the local community level. And we need local community buy-in to make these things happen. And like, you know, you live in Houston, I live in Phoenix. Those are very different places that need very different solutions. And so it actually works really well for things to happen locally because here, you know, it's, it's very much, we don't have to prepare for floods or, or hurricanes. We don't have to uh, worry about a lack of sunshine. There's like so many different things that happen here. We also don't have an oil and gas community. We have a coal community. Uh, you, you in Texas have a very oil and gas heavy community. So like the solutions look a little bit different. Do you see that a, do you, do you agree with me that it needs to start at the community level? And if not, why, or if so, why? And then, but do you feel like that's where optimism can sell better as well? Yeah, absolutely. That's always like my first recommendation is like, know what you want to do and then do it at the community level. Um, like realistically, it, it's easier to, to activate change uh, on a smaller scale. Um, one, uh, so that also yields like benefits for, like your mental well-being, if you're like right. fighting on a federal level, uh, something that's like really contingent on, you know, a political party, that's, that's tough. Um, that's just totally. going to be a tough battle. Um, and also like you're, you're alongside community members and engaging in, in that community action is always just so empowering. My, uh, m- my favorite kind of activist journey was filing a legal complaint against my alma mater um, with my students in my divestment group uh, for the university failing to divest. Um, And we did that forming a coalition with other universities in the country. And that was such, it was a small community, like 30 ish people, but it felt we, and we weren't successful. Um, Almost any of the schools didn't, it it didn't divest, but um, 
it just felt so invigorating and like the momentum was, was really refreshing. Um, so I think it's like the most impactful, not only like strategically, but also for you as an individual in, in cultivating like optimism. Yeah. And I look at like where the most progress is being made. And yes, you might have some failures. And I mean, I think you and I both know why it's so hard for universities to divest. And, and that like, just cause that failed doesn't mean that that's an example of like communities not working. Cause I think like, if you look at where the most progress is happening, it's at the city level, it's at the state level, you're seeing a lot of states move very quickly. Uh, even states like Georgia, where it's like a very purple state now, the governor has worked with the Democrats and the Republicans and the Senate and the House to pass some really pro clean energy legislation. And it's really worked very well in a way that you couldn't make that happen so quickly at the national level with what's happening at the national level from a division standpoint. Same with like cities like Miami, very purple political city. They're making yeah. a ton of progress on climate change and resiliency because of that. And they, they've they just taken matters into their own hands. And I think that doesn't mean that we don't need national action, global action, and these like UN conferences, Congress passing things, but it does mean that there's a lot of opportunity to build communities. And when you show that it can happen in one community, you also show other communities that they can do it as well. It's not like it's just siloed to that um, I mean, on that, I think from your perspective, what do you think that the role is of the federal government versus the state government versus the local government versus the marketplace in the private sector? Because you're I'm hearing I'm hearing you kind of touch on all of them. You're involved in the for profit kind of space in the in the entrepreneurship side. You obviously have talked about the importance of localities and, and communities, but you also know that this is a you know problem that needs national and global attention. Where do you see the decisions needing to be made and how do you see that breakdown happening between all of those? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I would love to be more involved in, in federal engagement. I do think that um, that's where the, the most amount of needles are, are moved. Um, yep. and, and especially U S being such a, the, the global superpower that it is. Um, but I, I, and try not to put that pressure on myself right now. I'm like, I, I can, you pick two. I'm going to do um, <laughs> private sector because you can just make change really quickly. A lot of capital is being deployed to climate tech um, in a variety of sectors. Um, so trying to kind of utilize that in order to make a, a positive change. Um, and then in terms of community, like that, that is something, like I mentioned, is, is important to not only strategic wins, but also my mental health. Um, so I'm focusing on that, but I think we, we, of course need, we need people who are acting on, on each, on each level. Um, and I think it, it does help. Like if, if you have a political background or, um, you know, you have more experience to get involved on, on the federal level, because, um, like we, we've, like we've mentioned, it's, it's not easy. Um, and it just, uh, there's a, there's a place for every skill set on every level to, to really utilize it. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and I guess on that, you know, you're talking about getting in the game, getting your skin in the game, whether that's on the for-profit side or the political side or the community side. Um, Where do you feel like when you talk to people our age who are so focused on that pessimism, we both have a lot of peers who kind of are part of that. And like you said, that there's, there's an understandable reason behind that how do you interact with those sorts of people and urge them to turn the tide in the more optimistic direction what have you seen work in trying to convince people who have been involved in the more pessimistic side to to join the more optimistic forward-looking side of things for those of us who are trying to do that how do you convince others to do it as well so i i try by by sharing some of the positive news and i think that's a that's a good entryway but it's not like that won't typically get them to get involved with with this change actually like being like upfront and being a little bit again abrasive and saying like look it's it's not going to change especially if if we're sitting here not doing anything about it rather other than complaining and, and being despondent yeah. um yeah. like you you might not have all the time you want to dedicate to this issue but you do have some time and you do have some skills um and you do have some money, so why not deploy that uh, 
and and see see what comes of it. And I'm sure the returns will be better than than what your reality is now, which is just facing this doom over over your future, our, over our future. Yeah, no, totally. And and I think the doom and gloom stuff's been tried for decades and it hasn't really worked. And so I think that that's also a compelling argument that like, why not try to look at where the optimism is heading? Because that's also like, this is a snowball issue. Like we have to work from growing and growing and growing these different solutions. And so if you work where there's optimism, you're gaining momentum in that direction. So if there's optimism that solar is growing in Arizona and you live in Arizona and you want to be part of that growth in solar in Arizona, then you're just one additional uh, person working on moving that in the right direction when it's already moving in that direction, which is like the best place for people to be when they're trying to move a ball down the field. And I think that that's, that's the power of optimism is that you're going where the progress is already being made and you're helping yeah. contribute to that progress happen fa- happening faster. And instead of trying to push back against something that might be such a big, tall order, like, again, you know, like I was in London seeing people block traffic to say that, you know, they need to go 100% clean energy in the UK, otherwise everyone's going to die. And so, like, that's that's a much taller uh, ask than trying to to join the progress that's already being made and and contribute to that. So on that note, of energy. And I was just talking about clean energy in the UK and and a place where they have kind of started to use nuclear actually from neighboring countries uh, to fulfill their needs past renewables. You have been somebody who has recently been outspoken about nuclear as a positive way forward, but you didn't always used to think that way. And I wouldn't say that I've had the same transition, but I used to never think nuclear was part of the solution. I never was against nuclear being part of the solution, but I never heard about it in the narrative. I never knew that that was part of the solution. Can you talk about your journey on that? And I think it's really important for people to hear because it seems like there's kind of a renaissance happening of of people turning to nuclear as a solution, but you have such a unique perspective as somebody who has kind of seen it from both sides. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think initially when I was anti-nuclear, I I honestly didn't know that much about it. And not to say I'm some expert now, Um, but what I did know at the the time was the potential downsides of of, of nuclear, which I I maintain are are, the potential downsides are are quite lofty um, and the potential community impacts and the lack of buy-in from community members, the kind of not in my backyard phenomenon where these reactors will, will end up being, uh, the, or these plants, I'm sorry, will end up being in poorer or, or more low income neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. But realizing one, that that could be uh, ameliorated by actually educating community members um, and being educated ourselves on the realities of nuclear. Um, really, I, I also thought it was, it was way too expensive. Um, the upfront capital costs are high, but then the costs to maintain are a lot lower. Um, and also, I thought it would took way too long to to set up, um, which it does in a, in America. Um, but that's a whole other that's permitting and licensing, um, which which are important, right? Because we want to understand the environmental impacts. But right. there's just a whole lot of as there's just a whole lot of red tape um, and just dragging of feet in, in some of these processes. So there are ways that we can make it. So we are saving money in, in a less amount of time while producing more clean energy, um, and getting that community buy-in. I I'm against, I'm like, I'm not pro nuclear. If, if communities that have these plants in them are Wait, let me say that. <laughs> yeah, no, you, not... you're not pro nuclear if the, the communities aren't bought in, but if they're bought in yeah. and they're part of the solution, then 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 you see that as part of the solution. Yes. And I don't think we need like representatives from from you know pro nuclear agencies to come and convince them. I think we they they need people who are pro environment to to come in and realistically establish why why this is necessary and and getting us even potentially to reach our net zero goals um, and really walking through the consequences and the probability of those consequences, which are a lot lower than I initially thought. 
Well, and I think that that transformational kind of look at nuclear is starting to happen for a lot of people. And to your point, a lot of those negatives either can be alleviated or are a lot better than they used to be. And I think one of the one of the issues with everything around climate is that there is nimbyism, not my backyardism, for literally every energy source. I mean, there are climate activists in the Northeast who were against solar fields and and wind turbines being in their backyards recently because of the way that it impacted the local environment. Um, but that those solar uh, fields and the and the wind turbines have to go somewhere. The nuclear plants yeah. have to go somewhere. You know, we have to build energy somewhere and we can't just put it somewhere else all the time and just expect it to just work out because that's just not reality. And, and to your point, the, the communities that get that put on them are oftentimes the, the ones that are going to put up the lowest fight. It's the like middle and upper income people that fight back because they don't want the wind turbines and the solar fields or the nuclear uh, plants in their backyards. But then the, then the, the lowest income people in this, in our society get stuck with, you know, the, either the, the eyesore at the very best or some really, you know, other significant impacts at the very worst. And that's just not the way that it should be. And I think as privileged Americans, like most of us are, we need to be more open to having these solutions be in our backyards, even if it's not as perfect as maybe we'd want it to be. Uh, That's just the reality of having lights uh, that turn on and um, powering the different parts of our lives that we, that we rely on. Yeah. A hundred percent. So last question kind of goes towards your, um, your entrepreneurial side, which is the role of our generation from the consumer side of things. You're really active on you, you and I were talking about the B2B side of, uh, consumerism and retail and thrifting and, and secondhand, you know, clothing and all the different things that have been, I mean, honestly, that sort of mentality has been kind of trendy for a while, but at the same time, consumerism in our generation is like at an all time high and we consume so much as a generation. How do you see that changing and how are you trying to be a part of that change? And what does that kind of look like going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know realistically if we are ever, our generation or future generations are going to consume less because there is more and more stuff. But I think like consuming circularly is a great way to overcome the consequences that might typically arise if we are to consume consume more. There obviously are emissions and, and embodied carbon in, in consuming anything, even if it's used, but it's significantly less. Um, and I think it's really beautiful to establish the circularity within communities, knowing that um, one person who uses something to the end of its life uh, can have a new life with somebody else. Um, So I see our generation and future generations consuming realistically like the same amount, but doing so in a more, in a shared and and communal way. Um, That's what we're trying to make easier uh, because right now, it's easier for someone to go to a fast fashion website or Amazon and order something than it is to look for it used on eBay. But eBay has a zillion listings. Like e- it will be on eBay, but it's not as easy to, to look right. for it there um, because it's not as easy to sell it there. So trying to fix that that issue. But I think it's really beautiful, not only for the environmental benefits, but just like community building um, to to establish this this greater circularity. Yeah. And I think that that's, it is largely a mindset thing that, you know, our, our, we always go to Amazon or whatever, when we could just go to, to see what eBay has, what, you know, even a local thrift store, whether that's a big Mm -hmm. conglomerate like Goodwill or the local, you know, church or whatever, you know, local thrift stores, there are antique stores, whatever. There's so many places where you can get just as cool things for less money and actually a massively, you know, more impactful scenario on the environment. And it's, it's really not that hard if we change the mindset. And I, and I, I love this kind of post that was from one of the big environmental Instagram pages. Uh, One of the few things that I felt like was like really using social media for good, which was kind of debunking this TikTok trend around um, Amazon and, uh, going to Amazon for all the things that you need and how easy it is to do that. We don't need half the stuff that we get and the stuff, half the stuff that we get, we could get 
used and it would not be any harder to get it. Um, maybe eBay's shipping would take a day or two more. I don't even know if that's true. So I think mm-hmm. there's, it's just a mindset change and it seems like you're trying to make that more accessible for people and, and more interconnected with their lives. The way that Amazon is interconnected with our lives is so seamless. And I think if we could make building a more secondhand thrift mindset more seamless into our lives or it doesn't feel like we're giving something away compared to how seamless Amazon is, then I feel like we could truly change that mindset. And, and it seems like that's something you're trying to work on. Yeah, that's beautiful. I'm going to use that in my next pitch. I like that. (laughs) I like that analogy. (laughs) Well, it's, it's, it's true because it's like, what we don't realize is that it's not just about cost for people when they're trying to make a decision it's also how much am I going to have to go out of my way to make this decision because time is money for people. And if it's $5 less, but they can get it on their or $5 more, but they can get on their doorstep in a day, chances are they're going to do it. Especially if they don't know about the alternative, uh, which a lot of times you don't. So you have to build that into people's lives. And it's something that it seems like you're working on. And I really appreciate that. And I really just appreciate the optimism that you bring to this, your book, and and also just your entire message throughout the last couple of years you know you you were a traditional climate activist in in every way from the from the way of kind of leading from the front and talking about the importance of this issue but you've turned that into um doing that in such a positive upbeat way that gets people excited and also makes them feel like they are part of the change and so it's it's been fun to see that and and i'm excited to see how you continue to use your platform for good thank you benji And before we jump, the Coming Clean podcast is grateful to be powered by Orsted, a wonderful company strengthening America's energy security with reliable and domestic clean energy. Through its integrated renewable energy solutions, Orsted is creating American jobs, investing in American communities, and driving American innovation, all while preserving our country's natural habitats. A clean energy future truly connects us all, and Orsted is helping lead the charge. To learn more, visit us.orsted.com.